afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session at the cross section of gender and financial inclusion. I'm your host, Mukund, and I'm a part of the gender and livelihoods team at IntelliCap. We, as a team, have carried out a variety of engagements that seek to promote women economic empowerment across Asia and Africa. At Sankalp, too, we have a dedicated gender track for the last three to four years. The, the sessions which have seen most interest in the last three to four years at Sankalp have been focused on gender lens investing and also on the um, sort of the success of the microfinance movement. Um, however, there is obviously a significant um, demand for debt capital from women micro entrepreneurs, as well as a significant amount of um, the women micro entrepreneur segment, uh, which is um, sort of for, which falls into the missing middle. So this session, the upcoming session, uh, with, builds on recent work done by IntelliCap for the IFC and emphasizes the role of debt capital to enhance the growth prospects of such women micro entrepreneurs. The session will be moderated by Samik Sundar Das from the World Bank. Uh, a quick introduction to Samir. Samik, sorry. Uh, Samik brings over 20, 21 years of experience in South Asia, East Asia, Central Asia, and Africa. He is currently a rural development specialist with the World Bank Group and has prior experience working with NGOs in the social development space. He has designed and uh, supported the implementation of large scale projects on community driven development, local economic development and rural livelihoods promotion. These programs have had a significant focus on indigenous communities, women empowerment and entrepreneurship, as well as in business incubation and enterprise promotion. It's our privilege that Samik has agreed to moderate this session. Before I hand it over to Samik, I would like to encourage the audience to engage with the panelists by uh, posing their questions in the Zoom chat window. Samik will definitely pick up some of these questions and pose it to the panelists at an appropriate time. With that, over to you, Samik. Uh, thank you, Mukund, for that uh, uh, introduction. And also, I would like to welcome all participants and panelists for this very prospective, uh, uh, exciting session on reorienting financial institutions to serve uh, women entrepreneurs. I think this whole topic is very interesting in the current context where we are trying to build resilience around women entrepreneurship and enterprise, women owned enterprises in India. And as we know, this, this segment in, with which we have been working for years now, have been trying to graduate into being one of the segments that would create uh, some impacts related to not only income, but also employment generation and, and livelihood creation. Uh, although we, we, there's been a very substantive effort that has happened in India over the last uh, couple of decades, I would say, with the organization like SEVA, the NRLM, the IFC, IntelliCap have been working to address some of the gaps that we see in uh, ensuring how do we bring this segment, the missing middle into the financial uh, sector in terms of being created with the customers. Somehow there have been various gaps and uh, which could be based on uh, the way we look at this segment uh, to serve in terms of financial services and financial product. Uh, the, the overall policy environment, the ecosystem, uh, somehow have been reluctant to recognize because maybe of their informality to address them as potential customers to invest on. So with, uh, and there have been a lot of kind of uh, data gaps. There's a lot of uh, issues related to formalizing them. There has been uh, very few players who have taken the risk to serve this, this segment of uh, customers, if I might say, to, to, to build their businesses and actually grow their business to, to the next level. Uh, and there have been various efforts that's been ongoing to various kind of uh, stakeholders who are uh, part of this discussion today, whom we'll hear, uh, to give us a perspective on what are the opportunity constraints and how do we move forward and learn from each other in terms of addressing the gaps in, in, in this, in this uh, sector of, uh, of including, uh, financially including women entrepreneurs, women and enterprises into financial sector or, or, or making sure they become uh, worthy customers of the financial, formal financial institution. Uh, uh, I, uh, the, the objective of this session is basically to ensure that we listen to this esteemed panel of uh, experts who have worked on this sector for a while and have been working 
to with to come up with solutions to these problems that is existing around uh, around financing women entrepreneurs or or women on own very small enterprises. Uh, with without much ado, I would like to introduce you to our first panelist uh, who will be speaking in this uh, discussions today. Uh, the, Ms. Uh, uh, Rima Nanavati, who's the executive director, Seva. Uh, Rima uh, uh, Nanavati was more, more or less universally known as Rima Ben, and I would like to address her as Rima Ben also today. Rima Ben, who's been working in, in, in Seva for the last, uh, I don't know, three, three decades since 1984, she started. Uh, she had expanded uh, the Seva membership uh, to, to, to new heights, making the single largest union of informal sector workers. Um, she oversees uh, around 5,000 self-help groups with 160 cooperatives and 15 economic federation with about 1.7 million members. She focuses on women empowerment by building women and enterprises in, in various sectors, which includes energy, business, food processing, waste recycling, textile and garment. Uh, she now currently heads the ICT sale of SEVA uh, developing customized uh, mobile apps for women farms and established linkages to online retail platforms. She has been the advisory council on the gender of the World Bank group. Uh, group. She was an invite, also an invitee, a member of ILO's High Level Global Commission on Future of Work. And, and she is a Padma Shri uh, already uh, honored with the Padma Shri from the government of India. Uh, over to you, Rima, if you'd like to understand from you uh, Seva's approach in terms of uh, addressing this segment and in terms of internal and external opportunities and constraints. Over to you, Rima Ben. You will have around 10 to 15 minutes for your presentation in the first segment. Over to you, Rima Ben. Thank you. Namaste, Samik Bhai. Um, you gave an elaborate introduction, but I'm just an organizer um, trying to organize the women workers in the informal economy um, in our country, where 93% of the workforce is in the informal economy. Um, I apologize, you may see a glare on my glasses coming, um, but it shows that the future is going to be bright for all of us. Um, um, and I think uh, I would like to start uh, by just quoting a small experience from our work. Um, somehow the host keeps muting me. I don't know why. Uh, so when I was visiting the villages in the dry desert areas of North Gujarat in the early 80s, I saw that every household had a woman who embroidered, yet they were all digging on the relief sites. They earned only rupees 75 a month. Here was a skill which had the potential to turn into livelihoods. And then I met Puri Ben Ahi, a natural leader and a fearless pioneer. I told her that if she could find women willing to embroider, uh, for a fair pay, I would bring them work and pay cash. So there started the journey of Puri Ben with four other women who took on the job of embroidering kurtas like the ones which I'm wearing. And in the very first week, they earned rupees 150, double the amount that they would earn digging earth in a month. Puri Ben started organizing more and more women with embroidery and other craft skills in village after village. And in two years' time, she had organized more than 15,000 women artisans. The women's embroidery is now the major source of income and livelihood in the area. Almost all the women artisans are illiterate. Today, a skilled embroiderer is earning up to rupees 10,000 a month through their own economic organization. Uh, earlier, when the women earned only rupees 75 digging earth, now the families have assets, land, water pump, tractor, house, savings, insurance, children attend school, migration has stopped. Women's employment has brought about a change in the community and in the family dynamics. I'm saying all this because I want to now come to the main point, is that by enhancing and building on the skills and the knowledge that a woman already has, 
she gains confidence in her own abilities she also gains strength from the camaraderie of other women so coming together on the basis of work allows to set in motion a transformation of herself and of her community i think similarly we need to look at transformation of the financial institutions as well where do women like who we can get this strength 93% in our country are women like puriben that is by organizing they can tap into their collective strength and know that they are not alone once they are organized the women of seva are able to take out small loans build their businesses improve infrastructure create markets and gain access to healthcare and ed education they can take on any challenge life brings them in short they move out of poverty organizing is the key there's no shortcut at seva we come together as poor as women and as workers she feels confident that i am not alone this has to follow by capacity building as leaders and managers the who may manage their own enterprises and need to build women uh women owned and managed enterprises this calls for a holistic integrated approach which works on building capacities asset creation and providing social protection we at seva college livelihood financing however we believe that there is a need for a fund that provides patient capital for these enterprises to go to scale capital that is patient with the organizations dealing with the poor and patient with the poor themselves we need to build a social infrastructure where the poor can absorb this capital at the pace that they are comfortable with and with a sense of partnership we need a fund that is partly insulated from the volatility of the international capital flows but is local in nature a fund that stays invested and is happy with a moderate return then a windfall capital gain that we see a lot of venture capitals angel investors and nfcs are looking for this is the kind of transformation that the financial institutions need to go why do poor only have to have access to loans and credit one has to look at credit plus 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 and that too i think uh, a kind of a financing facility or financial institutions need to reorient by designing new financing instruments and facilities which enable growth from below which is more sustainable a fund that will allow the tiny and the micro enterprises of women and poor to scale at their pace and graduate to small and medium enterprises this will enable the informal sector women and workers enterprises enter the mainstream and i think post covid we have seen that this is what is the most important and urgent need some of the lessons that i would like to share based on our experience is that this kind of a blended finance uh, a blending of grant patient capital and debt is a powerful instrument its key contribution is overcoming risk perceptions about underserved markets it gives the poor and women a fair chance to prove themselves something that has been denied to them for too long it serves to address a fundamental inequality of the global financial system the poorest have to pay the highest interest rates and face the most difficult credit terms and i say all this based on our experience of seva bank which today has over uh, 250000 shareholders and has a repayment rate of almost 99% so thank you so much and i hope we will be able to look at these kind of reorientation 
of the financial institutions and work together and make a difference to the lives of the self-respecting, hardworking and determined women around the world by helping them with the most important thing, they need a fair chance. This is what will really mean financial inclusion. This will then set about uh, in motion the whole process of digital inclusion, banking correspondence and e sub keys and mobile wallets and digital wallets and that all, all that we are talking about. But the basic, the most important fundamental reorientation is designing and reorienting and working out this new kind of financing facility, which is a livelihood fund which builds and enables recovery and resilience of the enterprises of the women workers in the informal sector. Thank you so much. Samika, you are on mute. Uh, no, I'm not on mute. I am I'm not mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, thanks. I think there is a centralized muting system which is working behind my controls. Uh, thank you, Rima Bain, for that interesting perspective. Actually, you have set the context for the discussion today. I'll just pick a few points that you made. One was on the poor can observe capital at the pace they are comfortable with. I think that's a very important takeaway that we might be pushing funds in a way that the poor are uh, at a faster pace than the poor can absorb it. And the, the issue related to how to come up with uh, instruments and facility that would actually allow uh, for blended financing with, uh, with uh, grant, patient capital and debt uh, uh, for, for, poor, for poor people. Uh, and also the overall, overall uh, disconnect or the, or the, or the uh, uh, market failure in terms of poorest have to pay uh, the most difficult term, to pay in most difficult terms in terms of the, 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 the debt they take from the markets. So I think there are very critical issues that we need to ponder on and also learn from Seva's experience and Seva Bank's work in the, in the last uh, many years to see how we can expand some of those kind of uh, uh, innovations and ideas that's been tried out and tested in by Seva and Seva Bank. Uh, 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 with that, let me move to the uh, second speaker, to, to our, uh, uh, our, our speaker from IFC, uh, uh, Kumar Salim, uh, who is the Regional Manager, Advisory Services, uh, Financial Institutional Group for Asia and Pacific, and Global Lead for SME and Supply Chain Finance Practice at the International Finance Corporation, IFC, a member of the World Bank Group. In this role, uh, uh, Kamar gets IFC's financial institutions advisory service business planning across nearly 40 countries, covering over 200 financial sector clients and providing technical support across 10 thematic areas. Uh, and uh, Kamar has over 27 years of experience in diverse commercial banking and business transformation initiative globally. And, and he is a uh, he uh, comes with a lot of uh, uh, you know, experience and learning from various, various sectors, which include uh, MSME, SEF, uh, climate, digital, housing, agri, gender finance. Uh, over to you, Kamar. Uh, we would like to understand the IFC's perspective on the problem that we kind of try to articulate in the beginning of the session. Over to you, Kamar. Thank you. Thank you, Samak. I, I hope everyone can hear and see me. Give me a thumbs up if you can. Uh, thank you. So, uh, first of all, many thanks uh, for having me today and uh, Reema Ban, uh, always a pleasure to hear from you. And thank you for so wonderfully setting the context of today's uh, discussion. I think you've kind of set the stage and I'll pick it off from where you left uh, in terms of the discussion. So what I'll try to do today and Tanushri, I think I'm a bit old fashioned, so I'm going to put up a PowerPoint and show you some visuals uh, which will be relevant for our discussion. Uh, but I want to cover, uh, in my presentation, I'll cover six main aspects today. I think why is there a business case for financial institutions to be reorienting towards serving women entrepreneurs? Where are the market opportunities specifically to India? What challenges exist that need to be resolved? 
uh, who are going to be the key solution providers, how uh, can financial institutions adopt impactful strategies, and in the end, I'll briefly cover uh, what IFC is doing. So let me take you through the, the why and the where and the what and the who and the how in my presentation of uh, about 10 to 12 minutes. So if I start with the, with the why, the business case, and, and, and we hear that a lot in our interactions with financial institutions, uh, Tanushri, if you can move to the next slide, on what really uh, is the business case. And it's not, it's not a social element that you have to uh, address. There is a financial business case of targeting women entrepreneurs as a segment. And why do we say that? I think I'll, I'll bucket my, uh, I think, response to more in terms of five buckets. I think one is the opportunity profile. There's $158 billion financing opportunity for financial institutions to really tap. Second is the critical mass. Uh, MSMEs, women-owned SMEs, are nearly more than conservatively 20% of the population. Thirdly, we see segment solution uh, possibilities when we see uh, concentrations in a few geographies. Uh, so hence, you know, segment solutions possibilities exist with certain geographical concentrations. Fourthly, uh, let me also highlight that how underserved uh, this segment is. Rima Band kind of touched upon it, but let me give you some statistics. 90% of the women-owned SMEs still rely on informal financing and two out of three don't even have a bank account. Uh, so you can see the amount of underserved uh, uh, population that sits in this segment. And while I, we heard from Rima Ban in terms of 99% plus uh, repayment rate, our own analysis at IFC shows nearly 40% NPAs are 40% lesser for women-owned SMEs based on the uh, IFC data and public sector data that we have collated. They are actually a better risk profile so there is a clear business case for financial institutions to consider this as a market opportunity. Now, let me transition to, so we talked about why, why is there a business case? Now, let me transition to where, where are these women-owned SMEs? And, and we see two, three main segments where they are more concentrated. One is really the informal space. We have a large population in the informal space. But also we are looking at informal, uh, beyond informal into micro enterprises. The micro graduates is another segment uh, that, you know, we, and we are seeing them hit a glass ceiling. Um, and, and that's one thing we are trying to resolve. And then there is a segment called very small enterprises. And this is, you know, where we are seeing the new missing middle uh, because that's the space where banks are unable to downscale and micro uh, finance institutions are unable to upscale. And that's really a space where we feel a lot of opportunities exist. And we've tried to uh, define that space. And, and the way we've kind of looked at it is uh, loan sizes of between $1,000 to $15,000. So let me on the next slide, uh, Tanush, if you can, uh, uh, let me go deeper into the where, where are these um, enterprises? And we have actually conducted a research together with IntelliCAP, um, as well as you know, with the Department of Economic Affairs on where are these women-owned very small enterprises, as I've mentioned in my previous slide. Uh, so you see that we've kind of defined them uh, uh, in terms of loan sizes between INR 200,000 to 1 million, less than 20 employees and annual turnover of between one and 5 million INR. So that's the way we have a working definition around uh, this segment. And we have seen that as per the research that there are seven main segments highlighted on the slide, which comprise nearly 70% of the women VSCs, which is manufacturing of textile, textile and wearing apparel, uh, wood products, manufacturing, uh, retail of food and grocery, uh, jewelry and accessories, uh, retail, beauty salons uh, and personal services food and beverages and education services and pre, uh, preschools. Now, one thing we would like to highlight here, uh, and in a lot of times we've seen financial institutions do not draw a distinction between manufacturing uh, women VSCs and services women VSCs. And from our research, it clearly shows the kind of the nature of the, the product needs, the proposition needs, uh, as well as the term uh, of the need uh, in terms of financing is different in both these segments and that needs to be taken into account. 
Moving on to the next slide, let me now transition into what are the challenges that the women uh, VSCs are facing? And let me divide them into four main buckets. One is social biases. Second is around having the right solutions. Third is having access to non-financial services. And fourth is around business management tools. So, and, and I, you see some of the examples listed here in terms of, and these are quite peculiar in terms of challenges that women VSCs are facing in the market. Um, and uh, you'll get the presentation, but let me highlight that these are distinctly different to some of the other segments that we've seen. But one thing that we have seen over the last two years, uh, we call it a pandemic of inequality. For the women-owned SMEs and women enterprises, the pandemic has uh, impact, impacted them disproportionately. And why do we say that? I think one, uh, they are heavily reliant on household income. So there's a reduced fam family income that is playing a key role. Secondly, they have reduced time uh, because of uh, family and needs that they have to take care of. They have reduced amount of time for the business. And thirdly, they have reduced business in terms of the overall pandemic has uh, disproportionately reduced the amount of businesses that can be done, especially which are not online businesses. So, uh, so we, I'm really happy to see that we have players like uh, Equitas, uh, Seva, NRLM, MasterCard on the call today, because you know I, I see a, a high level of awareness into some of these issues to resolve it for the betterment of the women-owned uh, VSCs. So let me now. Uh, transition into really uh, who can be the ecosystem that provides these solutions. On the next slide, uh, Tanushree, uh, uh, let me highlight uh, what are the, while it's a busy slide, but let me simplify it for you. I think there are four main um, uh, ecosystems and uh, solution players that can come into play. One is a bucket of access to markets. So B2B players, B2C players, networks, industry associations. These are some of the players that need to play a bigger role. Second is access to finance. And we are seeing players like uh, financial institutions, NRLM, intermediaries, credit guarantees, different entities playing a role in uh, helping access to finance. The third bucket, bucket is access to knowledge in terms of mentorship, in terms of training, regulatory bodies, associations coming together, uh, and uh, like Rima Ben mentioned, collectively resolving uh, the, the issues that, uh, that exist. And then fourth bucket is access to supply chain. And in the bottom uh, uh, of the slide, you see how rail sector can play an increasingly role, increasingly important role in uh, helping women-owned SMEs access uh, finance. And that entails in terms of standard setting in the bodies, tech players, the different elements, even educating, uh, incorporating them into their value chains. And we've seen some large real sector players take it as a, as a key responsibility. So um, going on further, uh, let me also briefly talk about the how elements. Now, the, the big elephant in the room is, okay, there's a great opportunity. Uh, there is uh, an element that can be captured uh, as a business case. Now, how do we take it forward? Uh, so financial institutions, and we have ourselves worked a lot in advising financial institutions uh, in creating propositions that can be impactful for women on SMEs. And, and let me talk about, again, four key elements here. In terms of having, first of all, a gender lens. Invariably, any client we've talked to has no uh, availability of data on what percentage of their enterprises and what is the number of women-owned SMEs or women in general they have in their, uh, in their portfolio. So I think uh, first is really adopting a gender lens, uh, gender lens in terms of data capture, in terms of segment solutions, in terms of internal, creating an internal diversity into your own teams, as well as in terms of staff training and building capabilities within the staff to understand this as a segment. So that's one, building a gender lens. Second element is really building partnerships. And what I mean is really going into the ecosystem and some of the players I mentioned uh, earlier in my previous slide, uh, uh, partnering on technology, partnering on technology, uh, enabled services, uh, as well as supply chains, and also effectively using data uh, to, so to uh, uh, solve some of the issues that uh, sit in the segment. 
Uh, third is uh, non-financial services, really bundling your financial products with non-financial products. It's not enough to give loans and financial uh, services to uh, women SMEs. I think you really need to have, and we worked with many clients in building such propositions. And lastly, having really uh, an element in your uh, underwriting and recovery mechanisms in terms of data segregation, in terms of process reviews, in terms of behavior score, uh, scoring. So then the many elements, so just to summarize a gender lens, partnerships, non-financial services and credit underwriting and credit approaches need to be uh, adapted uh, for being successful uh, in this segment. So I'll come to the final uh, couple of minutes of my uh, slide and I'll, I'll, I'll touch about what IFC is doing in this space, you know, and, and I'll transition what we are doing in India, to what we're doing in Asia to what we're doing globally. Uh, so as, as you're seeing here, I think we are, we are looking at uh, women uh, markets as a segment, women as entrepreneurs, as employees, as senior management, as consumers, as well as, as well as women in community. So it's not just a lens we are taking, one lens we are taking. We're trying to see a multifarious kind of approach. And some, some key investments we've done in India, for example, Mahindra and Mahindra, $100 million we invested to building a women MSME book. Uh, uh, the, 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 the gender bond that we did with Bay in Thailand, it was the first private sector gender bond issuance in Asia Pacific. Um, and, and there are many examples. And I, I, I mentioned some of the elements in the previous slide, but for example, VP Bank listed here was really building an NFS non-financial services offering. Uh, working with the Hazamfar in Afghanistan is really in one of the most difficult challenging markets, we are able to go and help our clients build propositions. Uh, I remember I mentioned uh, offering holistic and integrated solutions. And that's what we did with our client in Citibank, uh, Bangladesh. Also uh, digital is the new kid of the block as we all know. Uh, and we are seeing that, you know, digital only banks and digi digitized banks are uh, actively looking at the segment. So we are working with Union Bank in Philippines uh, to do that. And also sectoral interventions, we are privileged to be partnering with SIDBI, SEVA, NRLM, and other uh, key players in India. Uh, so post what we are seeing going forward are four or five main areas we are focusing on. One is post-COVID recovery uh, uh, in terms of how do we support women-owned SMEs in particular uh, recover from the COVID losses. Uh, secondly, uh, digitally enabling them. Uh, third, on affordable housing, uh, how can they, and the green affordable housing is another area we're looking at, uh, making them uh, uh, ready for a climate change initiative, as well as we're looking at startup, as well as the VSE ecosystems uh, building. So finally, let me uh, highlight that we uh, we have a global track record on the last slide, uh, Tanushree, if you can uh, please go to my last slide. So this is just uh, just a map that we are truly global in terms of helping our clients, not only in Asia, not only in India, but globally, uh, we have $2.6 billion commitments. We have invested in 89 uh, financial institutions in 41 countries and advisory services, which we see almost needed in almost every intervention we've done on the investment as well. We have worked in uh, with 52 of our clients, 33 countries. And some of the names are listed here. Some additional names on Asia are also listed here. Uh, so I, I just want to kind of, you know, end with uh, saying that uh, where I say it as gender advisor, as uh, advisory manager and gender is one of the uh, pillars of our strategy, uh, uh, we have really been looking in enhancing our footprint on providing uh, advisory and making sure uh, a gender component is added to almost every project that we've done. Uh, so in, 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 the, in the last, in the last, uh, uh, in the last one year, uh, we have the new projects that we booked uh, are all 89% uh, of them are actually linked to uh, linked to gender work that we are un undertaking and advising clients on building gender propositions. So in the end, I just want to again thank uh, the organizers for inviting me here. It's a pri privilege to be part of such uh, an esteemed panel. And we, as IFC, remain committed to supporting gender-inclusive financial services for women in India, in Asia, and globally. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kamar, for the very structured and uh, the framework was so well laid out in terms of uh, the business case. And I like the way you went into the why aspect, why the business case is so important to the 
impact in terms of how this can be reoriented overall towards the the new new uh, missing middle which you called as the women on very small businesses. I think many of us are struggling with uh, looking for solutions in this segment, particularly the way you defined it and highlighted in your presentation. But also what you did next was the challenges brought out in a very, very categorized way in terms of how we can look at the challenges in certain blocks. And then looking at the uh, who aspects, who are, who in the markets we are working with, who are the, uh, what are the access issues, how we can, how we can uh, link to build uh, from a gender lens, how to work with the ecosystem with partnerships. And, and very importantly, it's not enough to just give loans, but the non-financial services and the credit uh, underwriting aspects. And, and, and good to know the IFC's uh, global footprint and the, and the kind of work you're doing in South Asia and specifically in, in, in some of the countries in, in, in India, in Afghanistan, in, in very difficult contexts. So thank you very much for that uh, very overarching, but uh, very, uh, very kind of uh, structured presentation, which give us a framework to think through and look towards solutions on this uh, kind of uh, uh, problems we are facing in, in this, on this topic. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, move to uh, our, our next speaker, which would be uh, uh, Mr. Murli Vedinathan, who is the Senior Vice President and Country Head Equita Small Finance Bank Limited. Uh, Mr. Murli Vadyanathan is a strategic uh, banking leader with over 20 years of success in setting up branches, business verticals, and driving product innovations and profitability. Prior to joining Equita's small finance bank, he worked with uh, Kotak Mahindra Bank, ICC Bank, and Citigroup. Uh, he is known for being both people and process driven person with a sound understanding of Indian financial retail market by designing customer-centric products, analyzing market trends, limiting expenses, and identifying areas of opportunity. He has completed general management programs for my I am Ahmedabad and a certified professional in investment, compliance, and operations from AML and financial management. Mostly, uh, we would like to understand uh, from you on the Equitas uh, uh, current uh, uh, areas of work, on addressing some of these gaps that we highlighted at the beginning of the presentation and, and also try to link to what Rima Ben and, and Kamar presented in, in their presentations. Over to you, Mur. Thank you, Samik. Thank you all. Hope I'm audible. Hmm? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think this is a, a very right timing uh, with Navratri on across celebrations on where we celebrate womenhood and taking a sankalp towards making it happen. I think uh, nothing better than this can happen to uh, this discussion, this panelist, and for the opportunities that we create. Thank you, uh, Samik, for the introduction. Thank you, uh, Kamar. Thank you, Rina Ben, for the uh, fantastic opening and follow up by, uh, you know, Kamar. Now, the pressure falls back to me after a substantial and, you know, uh, loads of knowledge sharing given by Kamar. What next? See, before I get into what we are doing and how we are doing, uh, I want to put this landscape. Informal economy, the world is in crossroads at this point of time. On one side, we are saying uh, we are digitally ahead, technologically ahead. Uh, on the other side, 70% of the world's economic activity is coming from world's informal segment. So 70% of the people uh, are contributing to 70% of the economy across the globe through informal. So informal economy by definition at some point of time will become the main economic driving force. It's a matter of time if we get the act right. Now, if you get into the uh, developing market, 80% of the economic value addition comes from informal economy. Now, if you boil down to India, uh, close to 90% of the workforce is employed in informal economy and 55% of the national revenue. So it's not small. The opportunity uh, like we keep saying is a blue ocean strategy. It's without any gender, this is the opportunity. So if we have to boil down to the focus topic, what we are having uh, today, uh, I was going through some McKinsey reports, there are 432 million women who are at a workable age in India, out of the 342 million are not paid any wages uh, officially or in a recognized format. So technically, what's happening uh, is there are three strata of people who are in the informal economy actually contributing towards the economy. One is who is putting their labor into it. They can be a construction worker, a porter, uh, or multiple uh, things which they do. 
second set of people are those people who are having work plus little bit of capital and doing some sort of existence in form of putting up a vending shop doing some homemade activities and then getting into it third is a person who is having work capital and little bit of skill and fourth is that set of people whom i am isolating at this point of time who has along with this three and knowledge which means this set of people actually moved up the value chain to that extent that they can manage themselves now let's stick to the first three first three is what we are talking about a labor intensive or a labor plus capital or labor plus capital plus skill so if you get into um, a setup like india india has um, india and bharat you have bharat within india that's a part of urban and metro city development you can't stand up and say the brightest side of city and the lower side of the city have the same demography geography nor the capital benefits so which means how do we cater to urbanized india where we have displaced migrants as well as migrated people on you know their choice and how do we going to support them for their livelihood a in terms of uh, you know is it going to be only capital infusion only capital infusion is not going to be the problem solver or is it going to be a comprehensive approach of supporting them or is it going to be the skill enhancement which i am going to do along with the knowledge and how do we upgrade them so these are all the challenges which is facing uh, us at the uh, india side of bharat bharat side of bharat you have people actually we have a lot of women entrepreneurs like rima benji rightly said who are putting their efforts and started coming up the cycle who needs more of capital support which means there if you see bharat side of bharat you need capital support people uh, and a capital support society in the ecosystem that needs to be injected back which will create more prosperity and more longevity at that particular point of time and space and then you have next set of people who are looking up with a inherited skill without capital when i say inherited skill for example a jewelry a weaving or a pottery is not you know transported or transferred knowledge officially but working with those people so you have inherited skill on one side you have agriculture on other side third set of people new aspirants we will touch the bharat side of the business now let's uh, get back to how and what does a woman entrepreneur at this point of time manages like uh, kamar rightly said there has to be uh, the expectation of the society is balance your professional and personal life in crunch situation compromise your personal life uh, to an extent but don't overstretch on professional life but ultimately you land up in compromising your professional life so the startup which is called a startup uh, gets you know uh, into the live and die mode on a daily basis so you need someone who needs to go with them who needs to monitor them who needs to skill them and who need to give a hand holding uh, opportunity to that person for that person to lift up so if you look at our own model let's let me uh, you know get into our own model because it look very exciting because when we say beyond banking for equitas we mean it at every every act of us so we have a jlg form of a, a, a you know a group in every way so in, through jlg what we do we actually get into the uh, consumer we don't give capital like that we make them you know understand what is the necessity what is the need what is the opportunity cost of the capital then you land up in also training if they are lack the training so you give them some sort of a skill training third part is you hand hold them throughout the cycle of the loan and from there on also which means you are growing with them and once they are into the jlg and once they start doing the business over a period of time there is a human capital who works with that entire person as a relationship officer who actually monitors who actually gives advices who actually goes to the extent of even you know uh, helping them how do they reshape the business so it's a it's a total involvement which means it's a resource led approach which is very expensive for many of the banks now why banks shy away predominantly it's a low ticket size unsecured and one has to do these sort of activities to get into it but we as a institution consciously got into it and we have been uh, doing now we have close to uh, 2 million uh, women entrepreneurs uh, most of the women entrepreneurs because let's come to the consumption pattern of that as we uh, discuss along so it's predominantly focused on women as a segment we also do a skill development for women within this we actually done some 5 and a half 6 lakh 5 uh, and a half to 6 lakhs i think exact figures will uh, waver between these two who are got skill acquainted skill trained monitored and then were put back into the life so it's very important the transformation of this skill backed by a capital 
and backed by a monitoring mechanism through a resource who handholds and then take them through the life cycle and business cycle is the key differentiator. So, which means if we have to uplift uh, umpteen number of, because it's a blue ocean strategy, as I keep saying, most of our consumers at this point of time are first bankers, uh, they are first banking account with us, we are the primary bankers and they look up to us not only for uh, banking, but also for, you know, uh, uh, multiple advisors. So, which means a bank becomes an inherent part of the society, it goes beyond the banking. So, we take pride in that activity of going beyond banking, ensuring that person succeeds and grows with us, because it's a very critical activity. So, if we have to cover villages after villages after villages, the approach needed is we need to create a mechanism where uh, institutions commit uh, resource, commit capital, get into it, and get into skill trading. And most importantly, uh, you grow with the consumer and not we don't go with the thing of profitability per customer. How do we make the ecosystem viable for that particular uh, set of people to actually come and grow? Because the biggest differentiator in coming days is going to be how these ecosystems can self-sustain over a period of time. Like Rima Ben Mam correctly said that it doesn't need only a capital, it needs a hybrid capital. Of course, yes, it needs a grand plus capital model. So those models need to evolve. And I'm sure that it's a matter of time. But at this point of time, immediate requirement for them is can I get into a micro banking sort of activity? Because most of them doesn't have a credit history. Please remember, unlike a organized segment which we are talking about where you go get into multiple scoring patterns scorecard patterns here you have to go with the feeling understanding so which means understanding the need of the customer and praising a customer is art and science so now can i track a person's credibility based on their payment pattern based on the transaction pattern based on the electricity bill so multiple things one need to get integrated so that i actually evaluate a person based on certain pattern so i cover mass set of people that's going to be a big differentiator second biggest need is can we convert this into a microfinance into a od product so it becomes a revolving affair it becomes life becomes far more easier for them and third important thing what i see is these people we need to help them to educate on how to save and how to protect. Most of them have the velocity of money within their circulation so fast that what they get, if it is not parked or collected on the same day or within that period of time, they land up in spending. So which means how do you inculcate the habit of micro banking, which means collecting cash from their outlet or from their home, ensuring they open small time saving. Let me give you a small uh, instance. So to ensure or to test this, we created something called micro RBs, where 50 rupees, and let it be any amount you start saving. We have 4 lakh, 5 lakh women who joined into this micro RD with small ticket. So it's very important you create a model and you back it up with, you know, a platform sort of a technique where I feel complimented and I feel, you know, supported immaterial of ticket says I am facilitated, I am appreciated, I am encouraged. So the cost of doing one transaction might be greater for a bank, but we are not bothered about it because we want to ensure that it's not only capital infusion or debt infusion, it's also helping them how do they save and go about because there are a lot of short term needs. So we have facilitated micro banking as a concept. So I think going forward, micro banking as a concept, relationship obviously for multiple GLG as a concept. And third important thing is, as they graduate from level one to level two, how does the bank play a role of migrating up and up the value chain? Which means there are a set of people who have grown with us who came and opened up with a small utensil, today owning a small, uh, uh, you know, say a tea shop or a small restaurant. You have migrated those customers from there. So it's uh, banking beyond banking. What when we say that it's the progress, it's the fair and transparency, What which means whatever the terms and conditions we interact with them, has to be very fair and transparent to an extent that they know what they are you know, into. So we created and we went to an extent of creating an app or a QR code where they just scan it and see it or download the app. They know what is their interest, what is their interest payment they are doing, what's the outstanding. So which means it, it, it has to be made very simple. Today, as we expand the market, as we expand the segments, the critical need of this segment is how do I impart more and more skill for the skilled team? How do I impart more and more knowledge and for the knowledge and skill and labor, how do I partner in progress to create a marketplace for them to succeed? So this is going to be the next step of activity where we need to interconnect villages, interconnect uh, entrepreneurs and create entrepreneurial success stories across in such a way that they are molded and protected.
Now there is a second set of uh, people where we need to give a skill that is the next gen. Uh, when we talk about these generation at the demography level, you will have someone between 35 to 45 for what we are saying. For the present gen, we need to give them new age skill training also. So we are already into the journey. So it's a comprehensive cloud platform, uh, not only for uh, IT or digital at the back end, at the front end, how do we create the interface? How do we create micro banking as a success? How do we create savings as a culture? How do we protect them? How do we put a relationship management structure at a low cost model, which can integrate JLG or individuals to prosper with it? So along with this, only we can get the informal economy into a slightly formal mode. With that note, I sincerely thank you all. Thanks, thanks Murli for that uh, very uh, kind of uh overall picture and, and, and the way you put it about the labor intensive plus capital plus skill plus knowledge kind of a, a approach to look at the customers in terms of uh, how do you approach them basically and also the uh, joint liability group approach you follow in beyond banking kind of, uh, of, of serving your customers on skills capital inventory is, is key differentiator that you said in the, in the blue ocean strategy you spoke about and also about uh, micro banking and going to saving and, and actually protecting uh, that uh, the, their finances basically. Overall, I think it's a it's a very interesting example to look at equities in terms of uh, how you have club non-financial services with your financial services in a way to graduate and migrate people from small businesses to 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 be growth growth enterprises in a way in terms of scaling up. A very interesting perspective. I think there will be some questions coming to you as we move along in this session. With that, I would like to move on to our last speaker in this session, uh, which is uh, Alison. Uh, Alison Exxon. Uh, she is the vice president of the Mastercard Center for Inclusive Growth. Uh, she joined uh, uh, in 2017 to open the center in Asia Pacific. Alison leads the company's regional philanthropic initiatives. Alison brings significant industry and global international development experience, having worked at the intersection of development finance for over 20 years. Prior to MasterCard, Alyssa was part of the inaugural team that launched Grow Asia, a multi-stakeholder agriculture partnership catalyzed by the World Economic Forum and the Asian Secretariat. Alyssa also worked in impact investing and spent the majority of his, her career at the US Agency for International Development where she mobilized $2.8 in domestic private capital for local development project. She is an advisory board member of AND South Asia, uh, Southeast Asia chapter, and is on the advisory committee for the AND Gender uh, Equality Action Lab. She is also a member of the Business for Social Responsibilities Catalyst and Apparel and Manufacturing Industry Steering Committee for HER Finance. Uh, with that, I hand over to Alison to take us through what the Mastercard Foundation's work that is happening and where, where she will bring her perspective of bearing on what has been spoken and looking at what areas that we have not addressed in the problem statement we kind of discussed in the beginning and, and gave her perspective to us. Over to you, Alison. Thank you so much. Um, and I have to say, I agree wholeheartedly with all my panelists. Um, it is really we're speaking to the choir um, amongst ourselves. So hopefully we are creating a compelling um, analysis of, of what needs to be done, where we are, and the things that I pulled away that, that were top of mind for me that the panelists had shared um, were segmentation and the importance of segmentation um, and how the types of services that we provide based on segmentation will vary. Um, Similarly, um, thinking about the inextricable link that needs to be created between skilling of women entrepreneurs, um, whether that's business development skilling, whether that's overcoming bias um, that you might face in your community, and linking that with access, and that access to financial services has to be part and parcel of the solution. And assuming that you can do one and the other follows um, has proven to be a, a downfall in, in our approach to, to really empowering economically women entrepreneurs. And I think the other piece, which is really where I wanted to start, was really looking at the whole supply chain of financial service providers and making that certain that whole supply chain is geared and working for that last mile woman entrepreneur. And what does that mean? 
And rather than repeat what, what my fellow panelists have said, I thought maybe I'd give you examples of ways in which MasterCard thinks about, um, about these issues and what we're actually doing in India specifically around this. The one thing I will say is um, I'm actually not with the foundation. Um, the MasterCard Foundation is huge. Um, I actually represent the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, which is the philanthropic hub of the company. And, and why that's important is that we deliberately and intentionally sit between the business um, of MasterCard and the foundation, which is wholly philanthropic. And we leverage the assets that the company has in order to achieve scaled, um, commercially sustainable approaches to creating social impact. And so let me give you some examples of, of ways in which we've, we've used our philanthropic investment money um, as well as the assets of the business and combining those to really drive impact on the ground for women entrepreneurs. So let's, let's start at the wholesale level, right? So Kamar had sort of laid out um, the different ways in which IFC invests and engages and, and how important that is. And, and quite frankly, all of those need to work, right? Like if you don't have big banks that are making um, capital available to smaller microfinance institutions that are not necessarily always able to accept savings, then those microfinance institutions are limited in what they're able to do at the very base of the pyramid. And that is a critical part of growing the pipeline of women entrepreneurs. And so with MasterCard, um, about two, three years ago now, we launched a collaboration with Axion, um, which is a global collaboration, but we work quite deeply in India around how do we help microfinance institutions digitize their, inst their organizations in order to reduce the transaction costs that are associated with lending. When they do that, their cost, their uh, margins improve. So they're able to bring down the cost of capital for those very small um, women, informal women entrepreneurs who probably start with group lending. Um, and, and we think that that's important to not just look at the end borrower, which is also important, but to make certain that we are make that the institutions that serve them are uh, tailored to their needs, um, which is something that Rima had said earlier. And so that's one example of, of how we use our philanthropic money to really think about bolstering the financial services that are available and are tailored for women entrepreneurs. Um, at the retail level, right? So um, Morale had talked directly sort of how do you how do you lend to small um, to women um, entrepreneurs? Kamar had segmented out sort of the challenge of that new missing middle. And um, one of the ways that we've done that is we've actually said, let's think about alternative data, a little bit how like Morali said. Um, and the reason why that's important is, as, as Morali already said, is these um, entrepreneurs, these business owners don't necessarily have the collateral, um, especially on, if, if you're a woman, um, because collateral is likely held in your husband's name or any family collateral that you might pledge could already be pledged for your husband's business. Um, but then also they have just thin credit files, right? Like they don't have an established credit history. So we took a slightly different approach and are working with an FMCG company. So a fast moving consumer good company. So think of um, the Unilevers of the world, the um, ITCs of the world, um, and which are you know, clearly some of the largest in India, but there's also a lot of much smaller um, FMCG companies that also have data um, on how much of their products do Corona stores sell. And oftentimes this data goes back years and the data is on a weekly level. So it's really disaggregated. And so what we did is we worked with um, financial service providers, so banks, um, as well as FMCG companies to, to really structure a collaboration where the bank started to feel comfortable that with the sales data, the historical sales data that, as, um, that they could provide on Coronas and understanding what that FMCG's market share might be in a particular um, store, they would be able to recreate what looked like 
uh, what should have been sort of sales or revenue um, generation for, for Akrana. Based on that, they're willing to lend digitally without collateral. And, and that is certainly an arc, right? Like it does not start where everybody immediately gets access to credit, but it, it allows the bank to start to test this use of alternative data, use it off of digital means, which then helps to bolster and build more data points in an in a entrepreneur's credit file. And with that, start to open additional um, products that could be better tailored for their needs. Um, as Morali had pointed out, what's absolutely critical in this is that we are linking that, that product, right? Like that product that's based on alternative data that a bank offers um, with a substantial amount of training and upskilling, both on the side of business development skills, right? Like how do you run a more efficient business? How do you do marketing um, to attract more customers? How do you go digital um, in a global pandemic where uh, consumers are more and more preferring to either order digitally and certainly to pay digitally? How do you do all those business actions? Then also, how do you um, how do you work with your family and your community to help them understand the value as a woman entrepreneur you bring to the household, the respect that you deserve, um, and, and ensuring that there's not this community pressure or social bias that um, can derail success. Um, and so how do we do that all together? That particular um, support, we actually are doing with USAID and we collaborated with them with the idea of let's create a program that specifically calls out women-led Karanas and help to bolster them. And as Kamar had said earlier, there's clearly an important role, important role for inspiration as well, right? Like we want to inspire other women-led Karanas um, or women who are running the Karanas, but maybe it wouldn't be considered women-led, to be able to take a more prominent role. And then the last example that I'll give is truly around that entrepreneur. And as it's been pointed out a variety of times, the skilling piece is important and that we do need to think about how do you, how do, you do that and how do you do that at scale? Because at the end of the day, there's never going to be enough donor money available to train each and every single person who needs to be trained on all the variety of development issues that are there without us um, reimagining what that could look like. And so we launched um, just a couple of weeks ago, a new program that's called Strive that really focuses on how do we take learnings in the digital space? How do we apply those into the development space in order to grow small businesses? And, and how do we start to reconceptualize what training could look like and what uh, and taking the best practices of development and starting to apply them in new and um, different ways. And we're really excited about that initiative. And as a technology company in the payment space, it, it certainly plays to um, our narrative, but, but we also fundamentally think that if we're gonna see change at the magnitude that is necessary for 50% of this population on this earth to succeed, we're going to have to start thinking about development um, in new ways. And one last thing that I'll say um, is uh, in the next week or so, um, we will have a really big announcement of another um, idea or another um, initiative of how do we unlock more financing that's tailored for women businesses. I'm not quite at liberty yet to, to share the details, but I wanted to flag that since this is a community of folks who are committed to this, um, this space. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alison, for that uh, very uh, kind of, you brought out three cases to four cases to bear upon your presentation, which gives us an actual flavor of what is, what is going on ground and how you are trying to work in the digital space and how you're using data points to really uh, kind of have a known collateralized products to, to, to support various women entrepreneurs in the Kirana, Kirana, Kirana story, as well as what you're doing in the Strife program in reimagining how you look at digital, digital space in terms of uh, reconceptualizing trainings and, 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 and servicing many of these women entrepreneurs. And we look forward to the new product launch pilot that you just spoke about and we 
really want to see where it, where when it starts and where it goes and learn from the same thing. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Alison, and all the four uh, panelists to have very elaborately uh, provided your perspective on how we address the problem statement that we discussed in the beginning of the session. Now, what I would like to do in the coming seg segment is to ask uh, each one of you to pose a question to, to your fellow panelists, basically. Uh, for that, I would like to ask uh, 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 Rima Ben to ask to Kamar a question that you think after her presentation, what, what is it that would be that you have in mind after listening to Kamar? Over to you, Rima Ben. Oh, thank you. You gave me a great opportunity I was waiting for. So thank you so much. And I think my question to you, Kamarji, would be that, you know, IFC has been supporting um, to strengthen Seva and its social enterprises and go to scale. And this has been a phenomenal support. And I think uh, one of the key was um, in building the appetite of the micro enterprises and also give confidence to the financial institutions. Uh, do you think that when we all are talking about new economic pathways, uh, and as Moradiji was also saying that the financial institutions uh, are ready to come up with innovative financing instruments or facilities, um, to take on the risk and challenges of such partnerships with women's enterprises in the informal sector. And as Mr. Moradi was saying that, you know, if informal sector is 90 or 93 percent in India, that's the mainstream. So I think that's that's why it's now time that, you know, um, we do come and take such bold measures. So my question was that. Yes, Kamar, over to you. Thank you, Rima Man. Again, a very difficult question, but let me let me try and articulate in two, three different ways. I think first of all, the financial institutions are they really ready? Um, yes and no. Uh, I, I would say that a lot of financial institutions are dealing with a lot of complex issues at this point in time, in terms of you know pre-COVID and post. And I'll be a bit realistic about you know how. Uh, financial institutions are. I think they are dealing with uh, many significant issues. And, and I think there needs to be a, a high amount of advocacy. If we were doing 1x advocacy, I think going forward, we'll need to do 2x advocacy uh, to, to make sure that you know they, they actually embrace that. Level of awareness, uh, yes, is very high. I think from what I've seen, there is an intent and there is an appetite to go into this. You know. But I think how to go into that, that's that's the other element that we have to consider. And let me broaden the financial institution space a little bit, because we see banks, we see microfinance enterprises, we see NBFCs, but there are new players we are seeing in embedded finance, for example. We are seeing e-commerce players. We are seeing you know technology providers. And especially when it comes to the very small enterprises, the informal enterprises, I am seeing, we, we did a hackathon together with Apex and uh, Women's uh, Alliance. And you, uh, I think you may, must be aware of that. We see very, very interesting technology solutions coming through uh, for, for women enterprises. And I, I, I believe it will have to be a collective force. Financial institutions, NBFCs, and MFIs, technology players, e-commerce players, alternate finance providers, real sector players, I think they really all have to come together. So I think as an aggregated players, there will be a solution. Uh, but uh, the banks, uh, there's, a, there's a question on the chat, which I'll answer later, but there are many banks uh, that have created pathways in the country. And I feel in particular in India, there needs to be one or two couple of really large institutions that have to set the trend, which I have not seen it happen so far. Uh, we've seen it in many other, like Itau in Brazil took on and they took off, you know, and then many, many banks followed after that. Uh, so I, I do see that, you know, there they needs to be a trendsetter in India, uh, which really shows the way uh, two, three big uh, players that have to come in. Uh, sorry, a long answer to your uh, short question, but I, I, I hope I was able to address some of the elements of your question. But Kamar, why don't you take that question of the chat box which you referred to, and then uh, pass on your question to Murli after that. 
uh, I would ask you to ask a question to Murli as part of this cyclical panelist questions we're having, but answer the question that's in the chat box <clears throat> if you have referred to. Okay. No, I think there was a question on how the ecosystem partnerships uh, uh, have come through to enable uh, finance by by financial institutions, you know, and, and what are some of the examples. And, and it, I think, flows nicely from Rima Ben's question because some of these banks I'm going to name really set the trend in the market. So let me start. Maybe I'll give 12 examples rather than one. Uh, there are, you know, very quick examples. There are, when I come, come to South Asia, uh, NDB in uh, Sri Lanka, I think they they uh, they launched a very uh, interesting proposition. Citibank in Bangladesh uh, is another one uh, that we have worked with. Uh, when it comes to EAP, uh, there is VP Bank in Vietnam, and there is DBS in Singapore that has actually partnered with universities and uh, technology providers. In uh, in Eastern Europe and uh, Europe region, we see TBC. In Georgia, we see Guarantee Bank in Turkey. When it comes to Middle East, we see Bank Muscat, BLC in Lebanon and Bank Atad in Jordan. Uh, then we have Access Bank in Africa, as well as we go to Latin America. There is BHD Leon in uh, Dominican Republic and there's Itau in Brazil. Uh, so these are some of the examples of the banks that, that have, but let me bucket what they've done. You know, there are five different kinds of partnerships they've formed. One type of partnerships is with the universities. So many banks have actually formed partnerships with universities and created peer programs. And DBS is one example. HPL in Pakistan is another example. So there are many examples who've done that. That's one bucket. The second kind of partnerships with specialized training institutions. Um, and that's more physical brick and mortar kind of training. That's the second bucket of training. The third is around online uh, training. Uh, I think there are many online training providers these days. So that's the third kind of partnership. Then there are tech partnerships like Apex in Singapore and some others have done that. And the fourth is mentorship programs, you know, where you have a pool of mentors helping. So these are, maybe I've missed out a few and uh, Rima Bang will know more than me on this. Uh, but uh, I, I, I think these are some of the buckets I've seen in partnerships that have come through. So let me end there. I think, uh, and I'm Harry, I'm happy to share more details with you as you, uh, if you like. Uh, so let me transition and shift the gear a little bit and put the question to Murali, um, because, you know, uh, what we have seen is, you know, a pre-COVID and a post-COVID regimes. So I just want to ask you, Murali, you know, and from where you sit, what were the three or four trends that you were seeing pre-COVID and how do you see them changing post-COVID in terms of financing to women entrepreneurs going forward? Thanks, Kumar. It's a very uh, open-ended question to be very precise. We can go on and on, eh? but let me try to uh, discover three parts. But uh, as we know, the norm got shaken up, uh, COVID-1, we got into a new norm. Then COVID-2 came, again, new version of the newest norm came into existence. So one good thing that has happened is uh, digital adoption. Uh, the one which would have taken quite a lot of time, at least we are three, four years ahead in terms of Bharat, in terms of, um, if you categorize uh, into two buckets, as I said, one is skill plus knowledge and only skill. Uh, we never thought skill set of people will uh, migrate into a digital solutions far faster, which means they're able to download the app, they're able to see, they're able to transact, they're able to remit money. They are got into a habit of making digital as way of life. Now, this is an elementary skill. Now, if I have to use this skill to create the next level of activity, what it has propelled as is, uh, we are already working on something called Merchant App, which means anyone can download an app, can start doing their transaction, can start, it is for most of the Kiranas, which means any Kirana, any street side vendor, we want to get into that aspect where uh, you create an app, it becomes, um, uh, you know, a one point of solution for banking. In fact, you go to the extent of start loading OD limits or the uh, uh, CC limits or uh, term loan up to a small ticket, seeing the transaction pattern maybe in one, two months. So this ability to adapt has made us to rethink and start working on a project. This is a one win-win situation on either side. The second thing, what I have seen is uh, protection. Uh, Along with our account, we used to give uh, IHO, that is Indian Health Organization, uh, a free consultation. 
many people have started doing uh, you know a tele consultation with doctors uh, very very surprising part to take prevention to get into the hygiene aspects of life so the second aspect of me to survive in this business my health and my well being is also as critical like any other capital activity is a next big discovery and that we have done it again through digital mode to reach out to most of the people through the uh, digital channel saying that you leverage on this you will get the benefit so this has also increased the aspiration level towards protection which otherwise if you see um, uh, if you visualize a bharat in india which is that uh, uh, you know uh, payment uh, slum the hygiene and sanitation by itself is a very expensive proposition leave about the business dynamics so if hygiene and sanitation is getting a key focus because of corona it's a second big development and that leading to a health insurance uh, sort of a package i think that's a second encouragement which i have seen which means women not only got into digitally savvy finally started worrying about their health and their families health moving towards uh, digitally banked solutions for protection and also doing tele consultancy this is the second thing third important thing is most of the borrowers have started saving on a day to day basis as we know any pandemic endemic uh, sort of a situation can distort lives for all these informal sectors it can distort one lockdown one flood uh, one uh, fever it can actually put a halt and then they restart so they know when the they are at the lowest end of the supply chain but the economic activity of the supply chain kick starts from them so it's imperative for me not to come into a grinding halt let me start saving so most of the people who were actually reluctant to save have started blocking their throughput or profits back into the accounts and that's a very encouraging sign so these three things digital second health becoming forefront and focusing on sanitation and protection as a theme you know going to the extent of you know uh, forcing us to have i had to give a tele consultation and the third step is saving and all these things has put us into three different situation for create solution one is we are creating a merchant app through which we will connect the ecosystem through which we can make them transact save as well as you know get into all the other value added services so it has given us a good challenge and a an opportunity on either side i hope we leverage on it and we create a very uh, you know good solution by partnering with most of the big uh, you know organizers above us thank you Yeah, thanks, 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 Burli. Burli, there is a question on the chat box for you before you ask your question, Alison. This yeah. is about what would the profile be of such an advisor to the open entrepreneur? At which phase of the WE cycle would you say such advice is most required? So, can you take that question and then direct your yeah. question to Alison? Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, uh, this is a traditional thinking model uh, where you know. Uh, where we say when i look up to you when you uh, see you with a problem then i'll start giving an advice back right? in a um, informal economy that's i tell the informal world okay every interaction is a value addition to the other person that's the fundamental role of the banker the fundamental role of a banker when you meet in a formal is you sell your products you sell your transaction towards profitability as a motto here every interface the consumers are interacting their biggest expectation out of me is the what's the value addition i am going to give so for someone it can be uh, for example we we have trained 6 lakh women okay 6 lakh women uh, we have trained uh, so if you ask me uh, why did i train them candle instead of basket we it's there based on their interest so as the ro keeps interacting for someone the training will start on minute one for someone it will be on day one for someone already trained will come into a uh, loan proposition also so it's a very parallel different world so as i said in the beginning 70% of our work, uh, you know entire workforce and entire economic activity is generated there and there we need to get slightly more deep rooted and more institutions should barge in so that you know we actually uplift and uh, so this training is not based on life cycle or customer life cycle management it can be instant and we continuously train people few of them can come into and become our customer so it's a very dynamic process we are not fixed. but every one we have a very sharp the biggest value addition here is not only training we monitor them for example if someone's business dips someone says that uh, uh, i am struggling so uh, coordinating with the supplier coordinating with them giving them best practices of the neighborhood market and these things one cannot do uh, by sitting at a head office so it's it's a direct uh, activity one to one and here more than a facebook face to face is what is the critical link which creates the credibility 
Okay. Can you uh, can you now ask your question to Alison? Uh, Alison, I just want to explore from Mastercard's perspective. In a supply chain linkage, uh, if you take the front end of the consumer is the last end of the retail chain. And unfortunately, they make the lowest of the margin at this point of time. And whatever margin they make actually gets consumed into the interest cost. So is MasterCard or any card issuer going to work on buy now, pay later only for these set of mass front end uh, you know, retailers so that when it get integrated with a merchant app, which any bank develops, it becomes a win-win proposition so that you have credit-free opportunity backed by a credit given by the bank, then these people can look at a bigger growth. Can we get into this sort of, uh, you know, uh, what is a formal hybrid products development done by you or your team? That's a great question. It's a hard question for me to answer just because I'm not on the product side. Um, but I know that Buy Now, Pay Later is a concept that has rolled, has been tested and rolled out in a variety of different countries. Um, it, and you're right, it, it, it solves a challenge that the very last node in that supply chain grapples with. And I think that that's really important. I think as we think about the supply chain, there's other spaces there that you could also imagine um, where digitization can help to streamline and better allocate value. Um, so certainly B2B um, payments, for example, and ensuring that the smaller um, business in that B2B relationship is actually being paid more efficiently, faster. And um, so they're having, um, they're not having to carry some of the uh, inventory costs that oftentimes are pushed and, and really trying to um, create efficiency in that space. And I think those are also areas that are, are vitally important as we think about how do we come together with really an all hands on deck approach to solving the challenges that women entrepreneurs face and at the very smallest level, but all the way through. Thanks, thanks, Alison. And I think this is a brilliant question that Murli has asked and this needs to be actually uh, discussed further. And I think it will, it's a big solution kind of a question that you have asked Murli. I think we have to park it for a separate discussion with, with the actual product developers. Uh, uh, no, we should do that, Samit, because as we increasingly go uh, closer and closer to the uh, underprivileged and the deserving set of people, the only way I can increase the margin is to cut the unwanted cost in the supply chain. And right. this can be a big value chain, uh, you know. And this is a big catalyst which industry also wants, consumer also wants. And so wants. Also want. It's a total win-win kind of a situation. Yeah. Right? Okay, with that, uh, before Alison, you go into ask your question, Rima Ben, uh, there's a question which is open to the panelists to whoever wants to take it. Let's talk about aside from partnership with banks, are there partnerships being created with fintechs, particularly to small ticket size tech deployment? Who would like to take that question? It's based on the, uh, what, what are we doing on fintech side, uh, particularly for small ticket uh, tech sizes? Uh, any, anyone who wants to volunteer to take it? Uh, maybe Rima Ben, what you would, or maybe Kamar, yeah, Kamar, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'll uh, I'll take a shot at it. So, the, so definitely we are seeing uh, fintech partnerships. Actually, I don't know if I can, for the purpose, uh, uh, let me explain the, the different type of fintech partnerships that we are seeing around. There are 10 different types of fintech partnerships. Seeing SM, uh, Lending is one type, uh, but behind lending is also underwriting. So there are within uh, lending, uh, I think there are, that's, two, three different types of partnerships. We're also looking at uh, uh, FinTech partnerships on working capital optimization, cash flow management, accounting, invoicing, uh, KYC, robotics, and AI. We are also looking at partnerships on aggregated platforms and data analytics. And we're looking at partnerships on supplier loyalty. And finally, we're looking at uh, partnerships in cross-border and B2B payments. So there are 10 different kinds of partnerships we're seeing from a FinTech perspective that is coming into play to support, uh, especially uh, SMEs and particularly women-owned SMEs. Within lending, yes, we are seeing uh, a lot of banks actually partner with FinTechs. Uh, DBS, uh, you'll be surprised to know in Singapore has partnerships with 300 FinTechs for their SME lending. Uh, so there is, a, there is an increased, I am seeing 
even uh, banks in India are also doing that. ICICI is doing it, Access is doing it. The many uh, clients uh, in India are also looking at that, but in Asia overall. So this is, and that, that I, this area I see is a high growth area because banks cannot really do everything on their own. FedTech partnerships will be the way forward. Uh, and and, I, and I, that's the way I'll bucket it. And I, I can share with you some of the examples I've given with uh, examples of FedTech. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking that, Kamar. And definitely look forward to those examples if you can say it. Alison, can you please go ahead and ask your question to Rima Bhai? Absolutely. Rima, I was fascinated to hear um, about your livelihood financing approach. And I could not agree more that there's this need for patient capital, particularly for small, for very, very small women entrepreneurs and how to grow. And I was intrigued um, at, in your call to action that we simply need new financing instruments. And I was wondering if you could brainstorm with us now around what would some of those new financing instruments look like? like? What are the characteristics that we need that don't yet exist? And as we think about that, who are the right drivers for creating those new instruments? Is it actually the financial service providers or do we need something that's more um, donor driven in the beginning to pilot and test and then to um, eventually uh, hand off to, to the uh, private sector? Uh, Rima Ben, you may have two minutes for this because we are closing to four minutes to close it. So, so I'll be very tight, huh? sorry about that. Oh, thank you so much, Alison. Maybe I would request Sankal to have a session on this in the next uh, uh, conference because that was one thing I missed out on saying. But I think um, definitely, I think uh, there there are there is a need for this kind of an instrument because the existing ones mainly help in unlocking capital, which is a lending instrument. And what we are talking about is a blended pool. Um, so you also, as you know, Motley was saying, you need grant and you need to bundle it. So a credit plus, plus, plus. So you need a bundling of it. And I don't think there are any instruments available right now that will help you unlock both these kinds of things. And that's why the need, so SEVA is piloting a livelihood relief and recovery fund right now. And we have, um, as you rightly said, you know, we have three foundations who have taken the risk and I wouldn't say it's a risk, they will get a huge reward out of it as well uh, in helping us pilot the livelihood uh, re recovery and resilience fund. So um, that's where I think I would leave your summit by two minutes over. But a great challenge for Sankal that next session has to be on this livelihood uh, recovery and relief fund, and you only would moderate it, Samit Bhai. Thank you so much. Thanks thank you, thank you, Rima Bhai. Yeah, pleasure. so and and thank you, Rima Bhai, for sticking to your time. And definitely, I would love to moderate if there's such a session happens. Uh, uh, Kamar, there's a direct question to you on IFC in Ghana, um, MSME, if you would like to take it very quickly and uh, throw some light on that. Yeah, I think uh, there have been two, three different kinds of work. I think one was more sector level work. We have worked on credit bureaus and secured uh, transaction regimes, uh, especially uh, to allow working capital finance. Uh, for SMEs and women SMEs. So that's one uh, element of work. The uh, other element of work it has been around training and capacity building. We worked on SME toolkit with Busy Internet. Also, we worked with the three institutions, MB, uh, ME, BF, um, and uh, WAC, uh, SI. I think there are two, three institutions we worked with on the business edge training toolkits. And we're also looking at, you know, Africa as a whole. We worked with many institutions as well, Pan Africa, uh, equity bank, especially on leasing. We've also worked uh, on IFC Africa leasing program, and that had its impact in uh, Ghana as well. Uh, so I think that's where the equipment financing comes in. Uh, so I think we have uh, run an Africa wide program, which uh, Ghana was a beneficiary. I can share more details on this, but uh, we, we have run a few programs and continue to focus on it. Thank you for taking that question. So we have done justice to all the questions that was 
presented to us on the chat box and also the questions that we kind of circled around it's really risk and thanks to the panelists for asking these questions which actually may, made me think through that uh, my closer remarks would be so easy because it's just on time right now so that's only thank you because uh, uh, because I think the discussions have been too rich. There's a lot of uh, the ideas which has been exchanged, which is, we need a lot of follow up to be done. Like separate sessions have been already planned for the next uncle. So I think I think we couldn't have had a better kind of rich discussion and exchange of idea and thoughts uh, in this process. With that, it's dot three thirty. I will close the session now. Thank you very much, all of you. I look forward to meeting you and working with you in future. Uh, as we move along this agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Rima Ben. Thank you, Alison. Thanks, Kamar. Thank Thanks, Morley. Thank you. Thank you. Stay in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.